Welcome everyone to this session of Iowa Ideas. This is the human and social services track and the creative ways to address food scarcity and insecurity session. Um, a quick call out to our sponsors for this session. We've got ITC Midwest, Cedar Rapids Bank and Trust, and Inclusive ICR Iowa. We really appreciate them helping out with this um, the, this whole day, really. They've We've got a few sponsors on several different sessions, and it's it's a big important part of making sure this is a free conference that a lot of people can come to and learn from. So yeah, so we're here to talk about food scarcity and food insecurity, um, the number of people seeking help from seeking help from food banks and where the funding um, comes in for those things, and just wherever we can talk about creative solutions to to help improve the system that we've got right now. Um, so we've got four wonderful panelists. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and give a quick um, just rundown of their their qualifications and what brings them here. So to start off, um, Kim, do you want to jump in? You bet. Good, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining today. Uh, my name is Kim Guardado. I am the director at the Food Reservoir at HACAP. It's Hawkeye Area Community Action Program, and we're a community action agency that serves nine counties in east eastern Iowa, and I'm the director for the food bank. So we have uh, seven counties that includes Cedar Rapids, Iowa City, and kind of all the areas around that. So I have been with the community action agency for over 21 years, and I'm, I'm a nurse by trade, so I'm definitely interested in all things health-related and really focusing on the individual facing food insecurity and how we can provide supports for them and their family to be successful. Thank you. Uh, Linda, do you wanna go? Absolutely. Hello, and thanks for joining. I'm Linda Gorko. I am an Iowa native, and I um, am the uh, executive director of the Iowa Food Bank Association. The association is um, comprised of six of the food banks. Uh, Kim Gardado with HACAP is one of them. Um, and the additional um, food banks serving the state of Iowa, we, co we cover the complete 99 counties of the state of Iowa and we work with 1400 pantries and other programs and um, partners across the state. So I, um, I look forward to the conversation and, and creative ways that we um, can help reduce and end hunger in Iowa. Yeah, definitely. All right, Jamie. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Jamie Haberl. I'm the executive director at the Iowa Healthy Estate Initiative. We're a nonprofit organization that works across all 99 counties to ensure that every Iowan has an opportunity to live their healthiest life. Uh, so we work with a lot of different partners throughout the state to address that, um, specifically around food insecurity and, or like we like to talk about nutrition insecurity. Uh, we have a program called Double Up Food Box, as well as a produce prescription program that we provide to Iowans to increase access to nutritious foods to help reduce um, chronic health conditions, but also maybe help them best live their last, live their best life with having access to more nutritious foods um, here in the state of Iowa. Look forward to the conversation um, with my fellow panelists. Awesome. And last but not least, Matt, could you introduce yourself? Thank you. Um, great to be, be here with a great set of panelists. I'm the uh, state executive director for the Farm Service Agency in Iowa. That's a branch of USDA. Um, the the Customer facing um, services of USDA are rural development, farm service agency, and natural resources conservation service. You'll find those almost in every county in the state. Um, so we don't do the food stuff. The food and nutrition service uh, does SNAP, um, 400 food stamps. We have um, the school lunch program. So USDA has a really big footprint. Um, I'm here. Uh, as part of the Biden-Harris administration and really proud to be part of that team. Uh, we deliver programs, uh, dollars, loans, emergency funds to farmers in Iowa and you know throughout the entire state. But I also come to this as a fifth generation Iowa farmer. And, and in the 80s farm crisis, I was one of those kids that got um, free lunch. So not only did we get a loan from USDA to save our family farm, and my parents are still on that farm um, retiring. Um, I was really launched um, out of a position of strength because of the loan, because of the, the free lunch. I had the pink ticket at school uh, in the 80s. Um, so it's really personal to me. Um, 
my husband and I, we also had a couple of brothers that worked for us on our farm. We became their guardians. So we experienced firsthand some some young people who had been, you know, food insecure. Um, and and they're still part of our family. So that I, I come kind of wearing the USDA hat. Certainly farmers are the ones who grow the food to address the scarcity. Um, but I can also speak to um, a lot of the programs that USDA is investing in um, around Iowa to to address um, encourage more food security and and address hunger. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I guess I should introduce myself as well. I'm Emily Anderson. I'm uh, the public safety reporter with the Gazette. And so I'm moderating this session, obviously. Um, and to our audience members, if you guys have any questions for the panelists as we go along, you can submit those through Whova, where you logged in, and I will get those. And then we can hopefully throw those into the conversation as well. So to start off, our title for the session includes both food scarcity and food insecurity. And this was something I talked with a couple panelists about before we um, got into the session. So let's start off um, just giving a, a, a definition, I guess, for those two different pieces of it. And Jamie, you also mentioned nutrition insecurity. I don't know if you want to throw that in there as well, but let, let's, can I hear just from anyone in the group, what, I guess, what are the differences between scarcity, insecurity, nutrition insecurity, and kind of where do those play into each other? There's, well, a, there's, a, there's a lot, go ahead, Linda. <laughs> well, uh, there's a big intersection. I think that we all, they all touch one another. That food insecurity is I ones that don't have enough food to eat. Um, they simply don't have the food and getting the food to them is, is critical. Um, food scarcity um, that is not having enough food to get to them. Um, that's the big push that we talk about with ensuring that we, um, if they're rather than waste, we provide to those that, that are in need of, of food. So making sure that the food gets to them. And then Jamie, if you want to talk about nu nutrition security, um, that's the key element of making sure that they have the fruits, the vegetables, and a well-nourished um, diet. Um, that's in a nutshell. I mean, right now we have 7.5% of adults in a, that are food insecure in the state of Iowa and over 230,000 um, Iowans um, in the state. And um, we just worked the food banks and our all of our partner agencies. We distribute about 43 million meals um, this past year, just to give an idea of that. So just for food insecurity wise. Yeah, definitely. Um, Kim, did you want to jump in and say something? Yeah, I think what I would just add to that is that uh, when I think about food and uh, food scarcity, uh, as Linda mentioned, it's just not having enough food. And uh, through our network, uh, Feeding America is the, the largest hunger relief organization in the country, and all of our food banks in the state are part of that network. And so we talk a lot about how there, there really is enough food in our country, we just need to get it to the people who need it. And so Linda mentioned the food waste. One of the things that we do is food rescue. So we work with all of our local retailers to go into uh, all of the local grocery stores and collect food that they might otherwise throw away that then is distributed to those in need. So that's a big part of what we do as a food bank is um, really working to try to decrease that waste and redistribute the food to where it's needed. Uh, one of the words that I've run across the phrase, efficient allocation of resources. <laughs> and you know that's really what it's about is taking the resources in our state and getting them to where we need them to be uh, for equitable access for all. Yeah, definitely. Jamie, did you want to say something about, yeah. oh, sorry, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, no, I can just <laughs> add on both of their conversations. Yeah, so we have food insecurity, we have food scarcity, but then when we really look at it from diet-related conditions that our state continues to be challenged with, whether that's diabetes, heart disease, obesity, I mean, you could kind of rattle off a lot of the diet-related illnesses that are impacting Iowans, and a lot of that is based on the food system that we all consume, right? And so how do we increase access to nutritious foods that provide really what our body needs to function at its best and to reduce or even manage those chronic health conditions that one may be uh, diagnosed with? And so it's not only that food insecurity is an issue, but we probably 
more of us are dealing with nu nutrition insecurity than just food insecurity, right? And so how do we increase access to not only those who have food insecurity challenges to get more nutritious foods, but then how do we also just increase access to those nutritious items so that to all Iowans so that we actually are consuming those vitamins and minerals that help our body, our brain uh, work at best each and every day. Yeah, definitely. And, Matt, did you want to jump in? Yeah, so to, to give kind of a, a very broad global perspective is that, um, and, and I, I think Kim might've mentioned that um, we have enough food, right? <laughs> So even globally, there's enough food. The problem is, how does it get where it needs to go? Um, and so the scarcity side of it is once in a while, we'll have a conflict or we'll have a weather event where we do actually create a scarcity situation. Um, and then emergency food and other things come in to, to move the food where it needs to go. But, but for the most part, we have enough food. And part of that, the creative solutions here, if we look at in the United States, this this is all the way back to the to the 1930s and before, but really in the 30s it took hold where we we took this notion that we were going to invest in farmers and we were going to make sure that people had access to food. And so we've developed really really creative and I would say very effective um, public policy to in, empower farmers to produce and to provide um, very effective food service through through the federal government. So it is the, you know, the school lunch program, it's SNAP, it's WIC. And then we can talk about some of the creative things. Um, Jamie, you talked about the double up food bucks and the, and the you know, uh, farmer's market RX, the, the idea of prescribing uh, healthy food. So that that notion of we, we really produce a lot of food in this country. Um, and, and that is smart government where we're combining production, supporting farmers, uh, particularly in downturns, weather events and, and other disasters, but also a really effective food delivery system through the private sector, you know, through grocery stores with SNAP, um, through our schools with school lunch programs. So um, I, I, scarcity is an issue, but it's kind of a unique set of circumstances around natural disaster and, and human conflict. Um, it really is that security piece, um, food security and nutrition security. Um, that's the challenge. And I think in this country, we're really fortunate because we do use public policy. We use smart government to get that done. Yeah. Kind of sounds like there's multiple layers there where there's food scarcity and that's not always an issue, but then with you get down to food insecurity and sometimes there's a bit of a disconnect there. And then even from food insecurity down into nutrition insecurity where there can be even more of a disconnect where people aren't able to access those nutritious op options. So uh, Matt, you mentioned a little bit about some creative solutions. What kinds of things do you guys look at? What are some of the programs that you guys have as far as addressing those gaps between the different levels of, of food accessing, food reaching people who need it? Yeah, I mean, I think this is part of the creativity. Um, I, there's a lot of discussion about the about the pandemic and our national response to to the COVID pandemic. Um, I think we can look back at that and say, could we have done it better? Yeah, we learned some lessons. We certainly could have done it better. But one of the things is we did it pretty well. <laughs> I I mean we we spent four trillion dollars, but in that we saw child child poverty go down. We saw food access increase. The dollars we spent and invested in response to that enormous global pandemic and the resources we invested in our own country were quite successful. And some of the things that came out of that are some really creative things. And I want to lift up one of them, and that's the Local Food Purchase Assistance Cooperative Agreement Program. And I, I, I believe, um, you know, through IDOLS, we got like $1.8 million that IDOLS and then, you know, some, some individuals, um, organizations, that got to partner with that. So we were buying food directly from farmers to get into the emergency food systems. Um, again, smart government, good investments. Um, you know, that's just one example that kind of emerged out of that creativity. And certainly Jamie can talk to some of those too. We were one of the first states to get an EBT program at farmers markets. <laughs> um, so people could use their foods, you know, their SNAP card at a farmer's market. 
as well as modeling some double up bucks and some other things. We're incentivizing people to, to be at a farmer's market, eat, eat healthier with buying directly from farmers. So I'll end it with that because other folks probably have some things to say too. Well, the local... Yeah. The local food program um, has been, um, the food banks and uh, Iowa food hubs have been uh, participating in that quite heavily. And the fact that it's helping diverse um, crops across the state and also um, tier one type of um, farmers that are new and would never have an opportunity to do do um, to do as much production as, as they've been doing. So we've been able to do also very specific um, culturally relevant foods uh, for people in need and distribution distributing across the state. Um, I have to say that also Iowa is has probably with the SNAP outreach, it has a very significant program where um, we've had a hotline. The Iowa Food Bank Association runs a hotline that people can call in and we do telephonic signatures. Um, and last year we did 12, about 12,700 applications on our hotline. And I don't think a lot of people know about the fact that Iowa is has done some really um, forward thinking things. And um, a lot of people call to find out how did you guys do that? I know, um, but those are just a few things that, um, you know, additional things, just comments about the local food. Mm -hmm. oh, that's yeah, what that's I was going to add. I think the the local foods purchase program has really helped us uh, work with those new and diverse farmers to provide foods that we wouldn't normally, maybe foods that wouldn't have even normally been grown in Iowa, that because of this project, we've been able to focus um, funding into those programs and those growers to be able to get product um, for some of our newer immigrants that we wouldn't have even had here in the state before. And there's a lot of really amazing things happening um, in that space to, to make sure that we're, we're supporting our local farmers and then the benefit is those foods are available to those in need. So it's it's been a really, I mean, that's probably thinking of creative solutions. I It's one of my favorite projects recently because I think it builds a lot of sustainability for moving forward to be able to continue to invest in our farmers in Iowa and diversify uh, the number of crops that are grown. And then again, that food goes back to those who need it the most. Yeah, definitely. Jamie, did you want to say anything about the Double Up Bucks program? Just kind of explain a little bit more what that is and how it works. Yeah, um, so Double Up Food Bucks is a SNAP or EBT incentive program where you can go to a participating location. So we work with a number of farmers markets across the state of Iowa, farm stands, as well as cooperatives and Fairway and hy V throughout the state of Iowa, where you can purchase fresh fruits and vegetables and in return can earn up to $10 of Double Up Food Bucks to buy more fresh fruits and vegetables. And so this program was launched originally in 2016 uh, through private sector funding um, at six farmers markets just to kind of see like, how would it work? And would it help engage and bring more uh, individuals who have SNAP benefits to the farmers market, right? Because that also is a win-win for our Iowa farmers who are at those farmers market to be able to have more people that they can sell their goods to. And we've been able to expand. And I think one of the creative things through COVID was, you know, additional funds for the Double Up Food Bucks program. We were able to expand from roughly 36 locations to over 130 locations across the state of Iowa. And so really increasing access to people. And I think, you know, USDA was a major partner in that, as well as our governor's office and the Feeding Iowa Task Force. Um, and because of those experiences, we've been able to continue to innovate. And just last week, we rolled out uh, Double of Food Bucks is now digital. So they, people will have a plastic card that's reloadable. And so again, that innovation would not be possible without the support of our private sector partners who are helping fund that program, as well as a USDA grant. And so I think trying to identify multiple ways that we can address our food and nutrition and security program or challenges in our state. It's not just one program that's going to, you know, fix everything. It is having all of these multiple opportunities to really kind of address the challenges that we have here in the state of Iowa. And, you know, Double Up Food Bucks is one of those, but there are many other, like they talked about the local food programs that helps also tie in with Double Up Food Bucks, right? There's a lot of interconnections that happens around those programs that are being funded through government programs, especially the USDA. Yeah, definitely. Thank you.
I think those are all very good examples of kind of those creative opportunities that we found. And a couple of you mentioned that a lot of those opportunities came about sort of because of the pandemic and the lockdown and that you were working, looking for more creative ways to address that. I'm curious, as I guess the pandemic is kind of still ongoing, but as the lockdown has sort of ended, people are back out and about and, and the world has gone back to something close to what it was before, have those programs and those systems that um, emerged during COVID continued and are they still working effectively? I would say yes, many of them are continuing. I think probably even got even better, right? So I think any disaster allows for some innovation that maybe sometimes we're afraid to innovate because, you know, we don't like to fail, um, unfortunately, but you know, a disaster, you're thrown in the mix of it, you got to figure out an answer and a solution. And it may not be the perfect solution. But I think what it did allow is us to try a lot of new creative things, and continue to tweak and improve upon those things over time. And that's what I, you know, a silver lining, I guess, of going through a global pandemic is that it probably forced us to try some things that maybe beforehand, we were a little bit questionable if we wanted to actually invest and innovate in that area. When you're in a disaster, it doesn't matter. you got to try anything and everything. And so I think that what I have seen, at least, is a lot of the work that has happened because of the pandemic continues today, but are improving and getting better than even they were during just the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. As part of the Feeding Iowa's task force, um, there were some innovative programs past the pork. There was, you know, um, we know the stories we've heard that we were unable to get, the food banks were unable to get food. Um, delivery trucks were not being, um, were not coming to the, the food banks. It was difficult to find the food. So we were, that's when the, the committee turned to the local food um, and had some great innovation with I, the ISU meat lab um, with the beef um, um, council and Turkey Federation. Um, those things are have not unfortunately continued. However, we hope that can somehow um, be lifted up again. Um, we also had some um, excellent work with um, utilizing funds to purchase um, dried food mix that we're able to um, separate and utilize and distribute through the food banks. During the pandemic, we were able to, because of the support and the access to additional foods through the Feeding Islands Task Force, we were, we were able to, the food banks were able to distribute about 50 million meals across the state during that time. Right now, food insecurity is higher than at the time of the pandemic. And I don't think people think about it. It takes 10 years for usually when there is um, a, a severe, um, whether it's a pandemic or a um, inflation or whatever happens, it sometimes takes, especially those that are, um, are very vulnerable, it takes some time for them to um, restabilize themselves in their lives uh, with the, the items that they need. So more than anything, I don't know if people realize the great need that's happening right now um, with the inflation and with um, the recovery, continued recovery from the pandemic. Not everyone has recovered, but so we're saving higher than ever um, um, visits to um, the food banks. And Kim can talk about even just in their eastern Iowa area, but um, and, you know, in the in need of food. So the food banks are in great need of food. I think it was yeah. kind of a, a perfect storm that really happened as far as the you know the increase in prices of food and the decrease in the amount of USDA foods that we were getting as well as the um, the delivery issues that were happening with supply chain. So it, there was this you know like I said a perfect storm of opportunity where we were really in high need for food at the food banks and to be able to provide to the community. At that same time, we also had additional benefits coming from uh, SNAP through the emergency declaration that families had increased SNAP benefits during that time. So we did see, as Matt mentioned earlier, we did see a decrease in food insecurity. And when we look at the current statistics that we have, those numbers are coming from 2020 and 2021 when we saw a decrease in the in the food insecurity. So if you look at current food security rates, it looks like they've gone down. But we know that what we're seeing 
at, at the front lines and the people that are working in the food pantries, we're seeing higher need than ever. And, you know, that families are really struggling. And especially going back to our conversation about um, food scarcity, food insecurity, there is food out there. And so we really just need to get all those resources matched up. And I think, I think we have a great network in our state where we're working closely with the food banks, the food pantries, the food hubs, and lots of different ways that we're moving food around the state that, that didn't happen prior to the pandemic. And so I think there are a lot of things that we learned from that and in just how we think about food delivery and how um, we want to be more efficient about getting food to those who need it. So we, we have learned a lot and I think we've made a lot of progress, but we've also made some steps backwards in the last year or so that really um, has affected people from lots of different angles. For sure. I, I get to travel the state um, and talk to our staff, but also to, to groups. And I always like to say, I'm not a fan of big government. I'm not a fan of small government. I'm a fan of smart government. Right? Mm -hmm. And and that I and I think one of the roles that the that the emergency food network in Iowa, it's the food banks, it's the food pantries, um, it's the churches, it's this whole network of people who are so committed to making sure that people who are hungry have access to food. One of the really important roles that they play, and Kim just kind of alluded to it is they are the front line. So they're seeing in real time what's happening and providing that feedback so that we get smarter and smarter public policy. Um, one of the things is that, you know, the SNAP program, um, and I'll talk either now or in a little bit about the um, the, the summer pandemic EBT program that, that Iowa almost took a pass on, but then we pivoted and decided to participate in those those are rolling out right now for, for children. But this notion that, that, you know, we need people to be engaged around hunger. And when they're engaged, then we can do some really smart public policy as well, right? And so we did make these big investments in SNAP and other feeding programs. We came up with creative ways to resource the food pantries. And I think there was a lot of success but we can't take our foot off the accelerator <laughs> and we can't lose sight of the good work that was done and the creativity that was being implemented. Because if we step back then and start to pull back on, well, maybe we don't need as many SNAP benefits or maybe, you know, we don't, we don't need those creative ways to get people to, to donate or participate or businesses to participate in the, in the food bank network. If we start to pull back from that, because it feels like maybe, you know, pandemic's over, things are a little bit back to normal. We are going to leave a lot of people behind, particularly young people and old people and, and seniors, right? Those are the two most vulnerable groups um, that that in many ways can't take care of themselves. They're depending on somebody else because they're dependents um, and figuring out how we work together to make sure that all Iowans have access, that they have access with dignity and that we have a multiplier effect. And so one of the things with SNAP is that we know it's a very cost-effective way because when people have that benefit, they're shopping, right? They're going mm -hmm. to their local grocery store. And I, I'll just say this and then I'll let other people talk, but we were up in Lime Springs um, a couple of days ago, the Secretary Bill Sack was there talking about USDA programs and investment we made in Upper Iowa Beef, uh, a, a processing plant, but we brought together a, a, around a table about 10 different people telling the stories of how USDA is making a difference in their lives and in their community. And, and Kennedy Lincolnmeyer, she's a student at, at um, uh, Howard Winnishie High School, and she's a youth 4 age leader. And so she was sharing, and she talked about the importance of SNAP benefits for her friends in this very rural part of Iowa, right? And we know that, that rural Americans use SNAP at a higher rate than any, even urban areas. So again, just that awareness of these investments. Yeah, they're a cost, but they're really an investment because we're investing in people's lives. Just like myself, that investment of free lunch, it made thousands of dollars of difference at a very critical time in my, in my family's life, right? So we were able to use those resources to do other things to get ourselves back on solid footing. Um, and at the time, there were a lot of kids in my class with pink, pink, uh, uh, pink lunch tickets, the free lunch, 
because the, site, the, the superintendent said to the families, look, participate in this program. If you qualify, participate because it's a benefit to the community. And parents signed us up. You know, it made a big difference. Yeah, definitely. Speaking a little bit about those um, legislative programs and SNAP specifically, I know in the last year or so, I think the legislator passed a a bill that's going to change some of the requirements for SNAP, and I think that goes into effect next year. What kinds of changes are you guys anticipating looking forward as far as the work that you do and how those SNAP changes will directly affect the people that you serve? So I seems like we're all ready to jump on that one, aren't we? <laughs> um, you know, I think um, what I think what we'll see is that for some families, increased the increased asset testing or having to prove certain things will be will be challenging for some families, and not because um, not because they don't meet those requirements, but just because there's extra um, things to go through to get to get the benefits. So I think we will see that there will be some families that will just opt out of receiving SNAP services. Um, and that that isn't what we want. And, and so I, like Linda mentioned, the SNAP hotline, SNAP outreach, we have SNAP outreach workers through food banks that are working across the state to make sure that families understand what's happening with the changes and also how uh, we can help support families through the changes. Uh, to be able to um, assure that benefits are av available for those who qualify for them. So I think um, we, you know, we probably will see a decrease and we're, we're working, we're trying to get ahead of that so that we can educate people out front and um, understand, help families understand what's coming. Yeah. I think we're also unsure on how it's going to be implemented. There was some um, legislation that was passed, but I think we're also waiting to see how it will be implemented and how it will action will be taken. Um, you know, my I always um, I think Matt had mentioned that seniors is a big concern um, of of you know we're a proud state and ensuring that seniors do take the the um, benefits that are owed to them or that it's there for them to utilize. Um, so that is something that we always are working on, but I think these additional barriers will um, create challenges that we will, will, we will continue to have to work through um, to the best of our ability to ensure that we get the people the assistance that they need um, as they deserve, so. So the, yes. the, through the Food Bank Association, we have put together a SNAP toolkit that helps, uh, that's something that we can share with other nonprofit groups who are working with families to assist during that SNAP enrollment process. And the, you know, the goal really is to increase the awareness and um, help, help families get connected. Yeah, thank you. I, I just want to jump in one, with one more short thing that, I, I am a farmer myself, so I grew up on a farm, a fifth generation Iowa farmer. My husband and I farm, and we did the, the downtown Des Moines Farmers Market for 14 years and participated in the SNAP program, the EBT and, and Double Up Bucks. And the, we so appreciated when we would have families come up to use their WIC coupons, their senior farmers market coupons, their SNAP benefits. And I always want to say thank you as a farmer. I think one of the things that we can do, creative things we can do, is to continually thank families for using these benefits, <laughs> because when they use the benefits, they're helping their families, of course, but they're also helping the local grocery store. They're helping uh, the local, you know, sometimes the local farmers or sometimes just farmers in general. And we have a long history in this country of combining support for farmers with support for nutrition and, and food assistance. And to be fair, there's some political forces that want to split those apart. There's some political forces that want to, you know, pull back from that support, you know, reduce benefits, uh, nutrition benefits and, and food benefits for people, as well as benefits for farmers. So it is a live political debate. Um, and I, I'm not going to get into that political debate here wearing my USDA hat. But I do want to just advocate that that these are really successful programs. And just like 
you know, I thank farmers for signing up for our programs at USDA through Farm Service Agency. I also thank, whenever I have a chance, I thank people who are using uh, nutrition assistance uh, because it is a it is a really it doesn't just benefit them; it benefits the whole community. Yeah, definitely. I wanted, yeah, just uh, tag along what yeah. Matt. Said. I think a lot of us could probably better understand what SNAP is about, what how it helps people. You know, I always re remind people it's supplemental nutrition assistance program, so it's not meant to be the only thing, right? Again, multiple solutions to fix the challenge that we have around food and nutrition insecurity. But the economic multiplier that SNAP, as well as I'll double up food bucks, because I know those numbers better, um, is significant, right? And so, so every double up food bucks that we spend in the state, state of Iowa has a 1.6 multiplier. So if I spend a dollar of double up food bucks, that equates to $1.60. So again, going back to we're supporting our farmers, we're supporting uh, Iowa-based grocers who employ people who live in our community, those dollars then re-enter into society, which is a win-win for all of us. You know, so as taxpayers, and I'm a taxpayer just like the rest of you, right? It's great to see when you have programs that have that multiplier. That is smart policy and that is smart business that all of us should be really behind because we're helping those families, but we're also helping the economy and the communities in which those families are shopping at. And so I think, you know, I challenge everyone and I continue to learn more myself, right, about what SNAP is. What does that mean? How does that impact families? Who are the people that are actually receiving those benefits? And for how long are they really getting those benefits? Because I think there's a lot of misperception that once you have, you've applied for SNAP and you get SNAP, you're on it for life. And that's not the case. Yeah. Awesome. So we, we're about two thirds of the way through. So I want to take some time. We've got a couple of audience questions here that have come up. Um, they're both kind of specific to very specific scenarios. So we'll start with this one. It says, can food security be a reality in the U.S. as long as so much of our public resources go towards subsidizing commodities like corn and soybeans? Um, that's kind of a very targeted question, but is there anything you guys can um, add about, about how those I guess, how those subsidies work with or against the other programs we have for food security. I'll go ahead and jump in because I'm probably straddling that as much as anyone. Um, so there, there's, and I've been in this space, so I haven't been at USDA. Um, I came on, you know, with this administration in November of 21. But prior to that, I have about 20 plus years of, of agricultural leadership, food system uh, work at a number of nonprofits and educational institutions. So this is an ongoing discussion, right? So we subsidize, and we do heavily subsidize a narrow set of commodities, right? I mean, we have lots of subsidies across all of agriculture, but but corn, rice, wheat, cotton, and soybeans, also peanuts and sugar, you know, we do heavily subsidize those differently than we do fruits and vegetables and things like that. So there are people who are always asking the question, is that, are we doing that too much? And um, so that's, you know, a live debate. But we also look at the SNAP program and our nutrition programs, and we are vastly investing much more, you know, tens of billions of dollars more a year in those, in those assistance programs. And I would say that there's, they can be complementary. Certainly, we can look at doing them, you know, differently and better into the future as well. But this this kind of subsidies for for some crops versus, you know, support for nutrition, um, I, I think that sometimes gets played bigger than it actually is because I think these are kind of different buckets. Um, certainly, we can ex expand diversity in agriculture, and I think we're doing that in this administration. Certainly, is because we're looking at. Can we support conservation differently? Can we support climate smart solutions? Um, can we support um, you know, organic production, diff uh, different crop rotations? Um, we're really on the cusp and, and the ag community is coming to this as well. We're, we're really, the next 20 years, we're gonna see really an evolving, almost a revolutionary kind of time in agriculture where we're gonna see more diversity, um, we're gonna see more conservation. So. It is a good time to have the discussion because it, it's live and it's happening. And, and for most of us, we're going to see it in the next 20 years. Um, 
So I don't want to dismiss that, but I think that kind of it's 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 one thing against another is not necessarily, um, you know, an entirely helpful frame or way of thinking about it. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. If there are any other thoughts on that one, feel free to jump in. Or we've got another question here that's also similarly specific, but I think it's um, an interesting discussion. It says, if Iowa were to pay for universal free school meals, as other states have done, would that help stressed family food budgets and take one morning headache off the table for working parents? Do you guys know if that's a discussion that's being had as far as um, free school meals universally in the state? I think there's um, people that would like to advocate for that. Um, and I know that when we're looking at right now, ne nearly half of Iowa's um, children are re are enrolled in the free and reduced um, breakfast and lunch um, or have suffered um, some lack of resources. I think it's 40.6% uh, in the 21-22 um, uh, school year. Um, that was the, the the item that was looked at. So, I mean, I think it's something that it's continual conversation. It You know, that's critical. Um, receiving food at breakfast and lunch is something that we have to take a look at. Um, and it's an dis important discussion point. I think, you know, Healthy Meals for All in schools has been successful in other states. And, uh, you know, there's some, I think there was a couple of states that just recently passed that. So I think, you know, I think we'll see more data coming from that, but it definitely feels like that would be a burden that could be lifted off of parents if that was invested in. And yeah. I'll, I'll suggest this is a way to maybe think about it. For a long time, we've looked at the, the meals in schools as simply a cost. And, and you know, USDA, the, the kind of the whole thing, We've, we've developed a system to think about it as a cost and how do you reduce that cost? And I think part of the shift is looking at it as an investment, right? So when, as like, we don't, we don't, obviously we want to control costs of the school, but we don't look across the curriculum and say, these are all costs that we have to try to get to zero. We look at them and say, these are investments. So we have a technology investment, we have teacher investment, right? It's part of a whole investment mentality and I think that's one of the challenges to lean into is, and we're seeing it in some places where the idea of the school lunch program, the school breakfast program, food at school is an investment. So if we invest in it, make it accessible, make it better, make it um, available to everybody, and it, and that it's part of that whole curriculum, it's it's you know tied to behavior, tied to educational outcomes, all of those things. When you start to see it that way, I think it opens up that creativity, right? And, and I think we're seeing some states that are leaning into that and time will tell how successful that is. Um, as, as a participant in free lunch, <laughs> back when I was in high school, I'm, I'm kind of biased, but uh, I'm in favor of, of making these things an investment and making them available to, to, to all students um, in all schools. I think that's a, that's a challenging creative opportunity. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And I say, uh, sort of going off what Jamie had talked about, we're talking also about um, the importance of uh, that nutrition and food insecurity or food that nutrition security is looking at the social determinants of health. That's a key area that we have to look at um, for our state and for our nation. Right now, um, the food insecurity in, in the state of Iowa, it's expected that in it increase healthcare costs um, in the amount of about $121 um, per Iowan who's food insecure. Um, so I, you know, when we look at that, that's um, not a current number that was a couple of years ago, but as we look at that, it's the, we have, we'll pay for it in the healthcare system. We'll pay for it. If these kids aren't nourished, we won't have um, the people ready for, to take the jobs that we do have. We're, we're, we're nourishing our future. Um, so when we look at these, I think um, that's the important part is the whole concept of even <clears throat> pantries and food banks that used to have a, you know, a box of cereal on the shelf and that's, or like the cheese, um, the ready cheese and all that sort of thing that was put on the shelf. I think the whole dynamic of, of serving Iowans um, in the need of food is nutritious food. 
of um, the coolers and the freezers and the meat, the milk, the a vari wide variety of um, foods and um, really looking at, at social determinants of health and how can we reduce the healthcare costs and just and just nourish Iowans for a healthier and active life. Um, I think Jamie would talked a little bit about that. So I just wanted to emphasize the importance of that. Yeah, I mean, I think what's really important around this the school nutrition is how it's very cost effective, much more cost effective, you know, than what we are going to pay for outcomes when we're having to treat disease, right? Like, so the dollars that we put towards prevention are going to pay long term. And it's hard for a lot of times in our society to think about let's pay for things up front and prevent it later. We tend to be much more of a reactionary country where let's just react to it after the problem, but it's much more costly for all of us. And as we see healthcare costs continue to grow and rise, year after year. And if you think about our kids, they're entering school if they're hungry. I mean, I think we all know what it's like if your stomach is growling and you're supposed to be concentrating on learning math or science, it's really hard to do that. And especially in our children who, you know, their bodies are developing and that nutrition is highly critical to ensure that they can grow into a productive adult. And so when we think about any of those type of programs that really are more of a preventative um, strategy, they're so critical because the cost that we're going to pay today is going to reduce the costs in the future substantially. And healthcare isn't getting cheaper for any of us, whether you're paying for private insurance, government, you know, whether we're covering Medicaid or Medicare, it's all going up. We're getting sicker and sicker. And so how do we start to rethink about how do we prevent some of these diet related diseases? And I think there's some great strategies that we've seen work in other places, but we've also have seen we're very effective during COVID when we did have, you know, there was there were no rules around who could actually get breakfast or lunch in schools because we dropped those during COVID to make sure that people were getting fed, which was critically important. Yeah. Awesome. We've got a bit less than 15 minutes left and I normally wouldn't pull out my like big ending question until about five minutes, but I think this one might um, take a bit more time. And of course, if it doesn't, we can talk about some more things, but um, to kind of wrap things up, I, I, sort of broad, but I'm curious what, I guess, what would a world or an Iowa without food insecurity look like? And what does it take for us to get there? Good question. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I think um, what we look at is a variety of things. Um, there are multiple layers of we always talk about we're feeding the line right now, but we're also looking at um, wraparound services. Like when the people that we serve, how can we build them into so they aren't, you know, so that they they're served with the needs um, based on their needs of to to be a healthy um, participant in our society. You know, that's that's a key area, but it's partnerships and it's multiple programs, it's public private partnerships um, and coalitions and, and organizations working together. I think, um, you know, it, it is a complex question and um, we always talk about that um, with the hope of ending hunger, hunger, that's what we want to do. And if, um, as I think also how our local foods <clears throat> evolves, um, how our local farmers are um, being um, smarter in the way that we distribute um, services and also um, providing for the Iowans in, regarding that their needs are, whether it's um, work, you know, it's a multiple, it's a very um, complicated question because um, someone that is, sorry, someone that is, um, experiencing food insecurity is um is may have a variety of different needs so it's not just um looking at the one problem it's a multitude of um situations that we may have to look at thank you yeah so i kind of always talk about how um, we're not going to end hunger by feeding people i think uh, as linda mentioned there's so many different avenues 
that affect someone's ability to be food insecure. And I think it starts first with us really understanding the person facing food insecurity. What is, what's going on in their life that has put this situation at the forefront? And how can we build supports in the community through community collaborations and, and um, working together to have supports for families so that, um, you know, so that we don't, we can, we can provide supports in all the ways that help a family so that they can purchase their own food and have um, their own nutrition and health and all of those things. And so I think, you know, it's, it's so much more than, it's just so much more than feeding people. And we've got to continue to have these kinds of sessions, interact with individuals across the state and country and on, on lots of different levels. Um, housing is a big concern in communities, uh, transportation, language, there's just so many, uh, so many ways in which uh, families need additional supports. And uh, um, coming together, I think I think we can make a difference with that. What what you know you asked what is the what does the Iowa without food insecurity look like? And I, I had to just stop and think for a second. What what would that look like? Um, I wouldn't have a job, but I guess that's okay because there's plenty of other things to go do. But how wonderful would it be if we didn't have to rely on government supports, if we didn't have to rely on philanthropy, if families just were able to support themselves? And, and that's just not where our world is right now, especially um, inflation and you know, the current things. So um, yeah, there's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to think about, and it, it's going to take more than food. Uh, so I, I, I just want to mention the, the one, the, the summer EBT, uh, the summer pandemic EBT program, just, and, and I'm a, a proud subscriber to the Gazette. So, um, Tom Barton covered this on, on June 28th this summer, but it's, it's over $28 million coming into the state. It's $120 per child on an EBT card, 235,000 kids are going to benefit from it. And we're going to have an economic impact of forty-three million dollars. So that's smart government, right? That's this ability to take and do something very cost-effectively, put the resources, you know, targeted where they're needed, and and what that can mean. So what would a what would a what would Iowa look like if we had, um, you know, everyone was food secure? I think we'd have more farmers. I think we'd have more diverse crops. We'd have more diverse livestock. Um, we'd have more celebration of food culture. I think we'd have more businesses, food businesses and other businesses around that as well. And I think we'd have more healthy living. I think we'd also have less shame. We'd have less stress. And I think we'd have less chronic um, health conditions. So I think it's definitely a great question and it's worth pursuing because the benefits of getting there are worth the efforts to do it. Yeah, that kind of stole um, my thoughts is right. If we have people, if we don't have food insecurity, you definitely have people that are healthier and more productive because we know that food is important. It requires, it's required by each and every single one of us, right? We have to have food to survive. And so if we can take away one barrier and that may not fix everything because I agree with what Kim says around, you know, these social determinants, they're really critical. There may be other layers that are driving some of this, but if you can get rid of one of those challenges and we know how important food is for each and every one of us, um, I think would just be a much better state and a much better world because you have people who are healthy, productive, and giving back within our own community and our own state. Definitely. Yeah. All right, I think we've got time for one more quick question. Is, from this discussion, is there any, I guess, one thing that each of you would say that you would hope that people are walking away with um, as far as what our audience members, our community members can do to help support um, food security in Iowa? I mean, I think it, it takes people getting involved, like asking good questions, learning about your neighborhood, learning about your community, how can you 
how can you get involved on a local level, whether it's volunteering at a pantry or supporting your church's purchase of bulk food for the pantry in the neighboring town, um, what, whatever that is, you, there's ask the questions and get involved. Find out what, what it is that people in your neighborhood need and then work to find solutions for that. You know, sometimes it's, we just need a you know, play playground equipment at the park so we can, so kids can be more active and we can be safer being outside. Like there's lots of different ways that all impact food security and health at, at multiple levels. So I think it's that, it's that starting to just get involved, ask the questions, understand what things look like, and then see how you can affect that. Some people are comfortable talking to legislators. Some people are going to write articles for the newspaper, um, but really just talking about it with amongst your circles. Talk to the people you know, talk to your family, and, and get these conversations going so that everybody understands what the issues are and how we can all work together to address them. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I would, I guess, kind of go off what Kim said. I mean, educate yourself, right? Better understand who are those that are struggling with food insecurity in your community and our state, right? I don't think it's probably who you think it is, right? A lot of times we say it's not in my neighborhood or not in my backyard, but it is happening in your backyard and in your neighborhood. And so have a better understanding of who it is impacting and then understand what the different you know, resources are that are available and why those are critical. Um, I think stigma and shame um, and discrimination that happens around food insecurity is, it's, it's really sad, but it happens very frequently. And so I think if you can better empower yourself to better understand those who are being impacted um, and how you can be a resource for them, or like Kim said, you can do it at a wide variety of ways. It's not just one way for you to get involved, but just better understand what the programs can do and offer and the people that they truly are um, impacting each and every day. Yeah, thank you. I, I would echo the get involved, get educated. And one of the things is think about what a blessing it is to feed people and that investment. And, and one of the things we did on our farm, we had a lot of kids work for us over the years. And we would start when they showed up, we'd, we'd sit around the table and, and have have breakfast because they'd be working in the summertime, it was hot. We, the first thing they'd do is my husband, Pat, would make a big breakfast and we'd all eat if I was around. If not, Pat would, they'd eat breakfast. The investment of feeding people returns far more than what it costs to do the, to, you know, to, to do that investment. And so thinking about who are the people that, that we can collectively help feed, thanking people for using benefits, thanking people for taking care of their families. Um, it is something to really celebrate. And when we do that, then the world becomes a very different place for us. Thank you. I'd say the um, anti-stigma of really taking a look, more than likely you're sitting next to someone that may um, be in need of additional food, but there, it's something we don't talk about. Um, it, it's, it's very, um, it, there's a lot of emotions that go with it in addition to, um, just the need of food. So I think, um, we're working on an anti-stigma, um, toolkit also, um, through the snap outreach work too. So I think, um, just keeping an eye out for opportunities to learn in partnership. Um, if you can introduce two organizations that can work together, I think that's wonderful. So um, how can we work together to help um, work on this complex problem and have a hungry free Iowa? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much. I have really enjoyed this conversation. I think there's a lot that we can all learn and continue to do um, in regards to this topic.